Joining us now from Harvard University, Nicholas Christakis. He's also the author of Connected, The Surprising Power of Social Networks and How They Shape Our Lives. And I'm happy to meet you in person. Nice to meet you too, Steve. You were on this program last April, but it was one of those virtual interviews where you were there and I was here. So we haven't actually shaken hands until today. I know, it's nice. nice it's nice very to nice you. to be in Toronto. Let's start with this. Uh, I want to talk about obesity. Okay. And what you can tell us about the connection between obesity and social networks, because it's quite fascinating. Okay, so most people are um, aware of the fact that they're influenced by what happens to those to whom they're directly connected. So things your friends do or your family does or your coworker or your neighbors do and so forth. Um, so they probably wouldn't be surprised to learn that if their friends gain weight, for example, it might influence or increase the likelihood that they would gain weight. So that's pretty commonsensical. But what James Fowler, my co-author, and I were able to do was to map a set of connections in the human population over a very long period of time Look at how those connections changed across time. Look at how people's weight changed across time. And we're able to find evidence for the fact that they, people were affected not just by their friends, the people to whom they're directly connected to, but even by their friends' friends and their friends' friends' friends. So strangers, people you don't even know, your friends' friends' friends, for instance, they might gain weight and it might ripple through the network in a kind of cascade effect and come to affect you. So even kind of five degrees of separation? Not five. Four? No, three. Three degrees. At least in a bunch of things that we've looked at, up to about three degrees away. And of course, the effect decays. So uh, the effect that you have on those people that are three degrees away from you, and that those people have that are three degrees away from you upon you, is weaker than two degrees, than one degree. So of course, we're most influenced by our friends. But here's the interesting part. We have fewer friends than we have friends of friends and friends of friends of friends. Mm -hmm. So there are many more people that are three degrees away from us than are one degree away. So for example, I might gain weight and it might influence uh, my friends to gain weight, but there might be few friends, even if I influence them a lot, but I have many friends, friends, friends. So even though I influence them a little, there are so many of them that I might actually wind up having quite a big effect on the population in general. Okay, I understand how if I like to overindulge, maybe I have friends who like to overindulge and maybe we overindulge together. That okay. makes sense, we have a direct impact on each other. What would explain the, the second you know, stage removed and the third stage removed? Okay, so it's, it's, it's not magic. We're not saying that like I affect you and then you affect him and then it leaps, that it, somehow my effect on the next person leaps across you. It goes via you, so I might gain some weight or I might quit smoking and then you might gain some weight or you might quit smoking and that might in turn affect the probability that the next person on the chain might behave similarly. However, one of the most interesting things about this work is that it doesn't, it doesn't need to appear that way. So something is spreading from person to person. It needs to spread out through every person on the chain, uh, but, but it doesn't have to manifest itself in every person. So for example, if you think about germs, you can have a, a string of 10 people, the first person gives a germ to the second, who gives a germ to the third and fourth and fifth on down the line, but some of the people might carry the germ but not have any symptoms. They might be carriers of the germ, and we're used to thinking about people being carriers that are asymptomatic, for example. So you might be looking for symptoms and you see the first person has symptoms, the second, the third doesn't have symptoms, then the fourth does, then the fifth does. It's moving down the line, not everyone shows the symptoms even though something is being transmitted. And the same thing can happen, in fact, with something like obesity. So. I might gain weight. My weight gain might uh, change your ideas about what an acceptable body size is. Uh, but you don't, so for example, let's say I, I quit running. I start gaining weight. It changes your ideas about what an acceptable body size is. Your norm about what is normal changes. But you do nothing. You neither quit exercising nor start eating more. But when the next friend of yours down the line, he starts slackening off, let's say. In the past, you might have said or done something but now, because your ideas about what an acceptable body size is have changed, you don't do anything. Therefore, my weight gain has influenced your friend via you, even though you yourself haven't actually evinced any kind of change in your own behavior. Is this all happening on the subconscious level? It can do. It can happen on the subconscious level, but it, it also happens consciously. So it depends on the mechanism. So one thing, our work is often misunderstood. Many things spread through social networks. And here again to emphasize, we're talking about real face-to-face -face networks, the kind of social networks human beings have been making for hundreds of thousands of years. As we, opposed to As Facebook. opposed to online networks, yeah. exactly, Facebook, MySpace, the things that are very, sort of very recent kind of technological um, examples of these types of networks. So, um, so we're talking about real face-to-face -face networks. I'm connected to you, you to others, and as a result, we make this very baroque, intricate structure we humans do, and we have frankly, forever.
But so many things can spread, but not everything spreads through networks, and not everything that spreads spreads the same way. So some things spread through subconscious means and some things through conscious means. So for example, germs will spread differently than emotions, which spread differently than ideas, which spread differently than behaviors, which spread differently than norms. All of these things spread in different mechanisms. Some can be conscious, some can be subconscious. How do you know this is a real thing and not just one of those, boy, that's a hell of a coincidence, right, things? Right, right. So, um, and there are a number of ways it could have been a coincidence. First of all, it could be like a birds of a feather flock together phenomenon. So maybe, uh, you know, athletic people like to hang out with athletic people, uh, or people who like to gamble like to hang out with other gamblers. So maybe it's not that my gambling behavior is causing your gambling behavior. Maybe we be befriended each other because we both like to gamble. Um, and, and there's a lot of that that happens in human beings and in human populations. It's called homophily, or birds of a feather flock together, the love of like. And there's no doubt that that happens in everything that we've studied. Another possibility is that it's not that my weight gain, uh, it's not that you and I, I befriend you because we have a similar uh, taste in exercise or taste in food, for example, nor is it that my weight gain, let's say, causes your weight gain. Rather, a possibility is that we're both jointly exposed to something else, like a gym or an advertising campaign or a fast food joint or something that makes us both gain weight at the same time. So all of these things are possible. It could be chance. It could be that we form a tie because we share the attribute. It could be that we're both exposed to something else which makes us have the attribute, or it could be, most interestingly, actual influence. And you have to use a variety of statistical and sometimes even experimental tools to really understand this. So to pick up on the title of your book, if you want to be thin, connect yourself to thin friends. No, not exactly. <laughs> not exactly. No. Okay, so we looked at this. So when our, when our work first came out, headline writers had a field day. Okay, so for example, in, I think the headline in the New York Times was, um, are, you, are you packing it on? Blame your friends. Okay? Right. okay. Now, the British headlines were a little bit different. They were like, are your friends gaining weight? Perhaps you are to blame, hmm. which is actually kind of a very telling difference in a way of seeing it's things. Right. right, exactly. It's not, you know. Um, and so, and so uh, well, we looked at the work, but, and so a lot of people said, oh, well, all you need to do then is sever the ties to your friends, and then you can avoid this influence. Now, if your friends are all armed robbers, that might be a good idea if you want to avoid the, you know, becoming an armed robber. Yeah. But for other phenomena, it's more complicated. And the reason is this. Any potential benefit that you might get from severing the tie to a friend of yours who, let's say, is gaining weight is counteracted by the sadness or the, um, the badness mm -hmm. that you've lost a friend. Mm -hmm. So I affect you in two different ways. I affect you by the fact that I'm connected to you, that the mere fact of our connection has implications for you. And secondarily, or in parallel, I affect you because of what I do. And so it turns out that the solution of simply cut ties to people is not a good solution, because if you did that, you'd be friendless, which is not a good thing. Not a good thing. Uh, we all understand the genetic link between twins, siblings, family members. You've done some research that looks at the genetic link between friends. Yes. How does that work? OK, so this work was very recent work, and it was prompted by the basic, a couple of basic observations. First of all, when we look at human social networks, when we look at their structure, it turns out that almost wherever they are examined, they follow very specific mathematical patterns. So if you've ever seen a picture of a network nowadays, many people have seen these images, they all kind of look the same. Why? Why do we assemble ourselves into networks that look like this? First fundamental question. Second, when we looked at some, we did some work on the spread of emotions, we saw that that, human, that emotions can spread between people. This is a very qu uh, quizzical uh, thing as well. Why, why should that be? When I have an emotion, I, um, I don't, it, it, would, it could be to my advantage, evolutionarily speaking, to have the emotion, but I don't just have it, I show it. And I don't just show it, but you can read it. And you don't just read it, you copy it. In, there's emotional contagion in human beings, and it's an intrinsic or important part of emotions. So there's something about emotional contagion that also seems very fundamental, that, Second point. So first point is networks always look kind of the same. Second, emotional contagion seems to be a very basic thing in humans. Third, humans are very unusual as a species in that we form, we have friends. Why? Why do we have friends? I mean, it's not surprising that we have mates. Every species, every sexually reproducing species has mates. But we also have friends. And not only that, finally, um, we tend to prefer friends who resemble us. 
And many people just take this for granted, that you know this thing we were talking about earlier, the love of like or homophily, birds of a feather flock together. But it's well to ask the question, why? So because of these various kinds of observations, uh, what James and I decided to do was to try to begin to explore the evolutionary origin and the genetic basis for human social networks. And we've done a number of studies which have shown that, um, that human beings assemble themselves into these networks uh, for a variety of deep genetic reasons, in part, and also that their assembly into these networks has a number of implications, which we can discuss. If you'd sure. Like. Well, let's go. I mean, ge the, the ge okay. genetic ties. That's a okay. So fascinating. Okay. So the first. Okay. So the first thing is, the number of friends you have. About fifty percent of the variation in the number of friends that people have can be ascribed to their genes. So some people have many friends. Some people have few friends. It turns out that this taste for friendship is partially genetic, not exclusively, and we're not genetic determinists. We're not just saying this complex social phenomenon is m reducible to genes. Let me just jump in there. Yeah. I don't get that. Why would that be? I, I understand why I might have friends who like football as I do. No, it's or, not. But, but why genetics? Okay, so no, it's not, it's not the traits of your friends yet. We'll get there. Okay. Right now we're just talking about how many friends you have. So some people, for example, are born shy, and some are born gregarious. This trait, this sort of personality trait, if you will, this taste for friendship, most people wouldn't be surprised to hear that, uh, that people might vary in this trait and that there might be a partially genetic basis for this taste in having friends. Okay. Some people like many, some like few, let's say. On average, we find that the average American, a North American, has about 4.5 uh, personal contacts. So people vary. About 5% have nobody. They are alone. About 5% have about eight people who they would describe as social intimates. And on average, it's about four and a half. Okay? First point. Second point, it turns out that it's not just the number of friends that varies. Many people would sort of intuitively grasp this. But it turns out more complicated things also vary. It turns out where you are in the network, whether you're in the middle of this elaborate network or on the edge of the network, is also partially genetic. And here's something that's very bizarre that varies from person to person. If you have three people in a room, let's say Tom, Dick, and Harry, whether, whether Dick is friends with Harry depends not just on Dick's genes, and not just on Harry's genes, but on Tom's genes. So whether I'm a friend of yours depends not just on my genes, not just on your genes, but, but on too. his genes. And we think the reason for this is that people vary in their inclination to introduce their friends to each other. So he introduces us to each other. That's why his genes determine whether we know each other. So, so there's variation in, in, in the uh, inclination that people have to introduce their friends to each other. And if you think about it and you look around you, you will probably notice that, hey, some people are constantly trying to knit the network around them together. They're almost busybody-ish, introducing all these people. Others couldn't care less if their friends know each other. So people vary in this. OK. As a result of all of that, it turns out that each of us acting on our own, varying in how many friends we have, varying in whether we introduce our friends to each other, varying in how central we want to be in the network, uh, wind up creating this very ornate, very specific pattern, this human network, and wind up occupying a particular location in it. Even more interesting than that, it turns out that uh, the, we found in some work that we're just publishing this week, it turns out that as a result of that, or perhaps as a determinant of that, uh, people come to resemble their friends on a very deep genetic basis. So that, for instance, particular variants of particular genes that I have are identical to the particular variants of particular genes that my friends have. And this is actually a very, a very weird and very interesting finding. Because what it means is, is that your biological destiny is not just a function of your own genes, but also a function of the genes of your friends. <laughs> it means that you live your life not just among your friends, but among your friends' genes. You're swimming in the sea of the genes of others. And I can give you a very specific example that might illustrate this point, actually Please. taken from hens. They found that if you look at the feather condition of hens that were caged, and you looked at the genes of the hens' neighbors, the genes of the neighboring hens had as much to do with the index hen's feather condition as the genes of the index hen. So that once a phenotype, some attribute of this hen, depends not just on her own genes, but on the genes of the animals around her. And this may have to do, for a variety of uh, mechanisms, may have to do with the social interactions between the hens, uh, may have to do with um, uh, some kind of uh, signaling, chemical signaling between the hens. And something similar, we believe, happens in humans. I can see how this works at a theoretical level. Mm -hmm. How do you prove this? 
Mm. Well, so we, we've done a variety of studies looking at thousands of people and uh, measuring um, their genes, uh, looking at uh, different genetic markers in these people. In one of our samples, we have 12,000 people and 500,000 genetic markers in each of the people. And, um, and we are able then to assemble people into networks, understand their genome at a very deep level, and then look at the extent to which people match each other on these genes. And we're also able to um, do other kinds of studies that involve uh, 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 twins that are um, fraternal twins and identical twins, mm -hmm. and do certain mathematical comparisons of those pairs of twins and come to some of the other conclusions that I was describing earlier. And when you do the tail of the tape, have you been able to kind of make a decision one way or another about which is more uh, forceful as an influence in our lives, nature versus nurture? So I, yeah, so that's a, fa that's a famous <laughs> dichotomy. So I'd like to avoid that. They're both important, okay? And I think it's almost a false dichotomy. Um, I think both are required. And I think that um, one of the things that we're saying, though, and this is, this is an interesting idea, uh, I think, uh, one of the things that we're saying is, is that there may be a genetic predilection not only to how many friends you pick, but to which friends you pick. And so you, you have a nature that may cause you to make your own nurture. You may pick friends, for example, that are kinder to you. Or you may pick friends that have particular attributes. And their attributes may come to be highly relevant to what happens. So for the sake of argument, let's say you pick friends. Let's say you insist on only surrounding yourself with friends who are immune to some kind of crazy disease. Well, that disease can never reach you because you have a created a buffer around you of people who are immune to that condition. So this is one of the ways in which uh, nature might make nurture. This environment that you create around you, the, which is a nurture, might depend in part on the nature, which is your genetic constitution. And again, it's not either or. Both of these things are important. And I guess just finally, why do you think it's important for us to know this? Ah. I think that I think that um, I think that there is a very deep connection between social networks and goodness, actually. And I think that the fact that we humans are not only a social species, we don't just live in groups, but we live in networks, is a very profound significance. And here's why. So if I was always violent towards you, if I infected you with deadly germs or um, or gave you misinformation, or made you miserably unhappy. You would not be coming back as a guest on the program. Exactly, and you would cut the ties to me and the network would disintegrate. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the spread of good and desirable things, like love and affection and kindness and ideas, is required to sustain and nourish the human network. And conversely, the network is required for these good things to come to pass. If you think about the virtues that we humans have, they're typically social virtues. Mm -hmm. Things like altruism and justice, uh, beneficence, these kinds of things that we revere as fundamental human um, good qualities are connected to our interactions with others. So I think that there is this very deep connection between social networks, actually, and these virtues. Because I think the benefits of a connected life outweigh the costs. So is it your hope to spread the knowledge that this exists in the hopes that it will influence people's behavior or choices or? Well, I think, that, I think that a better understanding of our humanity and a better understanding of how it is that we come to be interdependent offers the opportunity to, um, to make a number of um, improvements in the world. So there are a number of public health and public policy implications that come from realizing that we're all connected, that come from understanding the reasons we're connected and how we affect each other. Uh, it's really good of you to come up here to Toronto and to meet you in person. Thank you so much, Steve. Nicholas Christakis, Connected, the Surprising Power of Social Networks and How They Shape Our Lives. Great to see you. Thank you.